Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Gordon Byrne Prize 2021. I'm Claire Malcolm. I'm the Chief Executive of New Writing North that run the book festival. And it's really great to be back. We were all slightly giddy. I mean, this is often a giddy night for us anyway, but it's an extra specially giddy night tonight. So great to be back. Thank you all for coming. Um, thank you for everyone who's joining us on the live stream tonight. That's an extra special, exciting thing that's happening as well. So there are lots of people we know who support the prize who couldn't be here tonight. Um, and I know many of them are watching. So welcome everyone and thanks for coming. A literary polymath, Gordon Byrne wrote about subjects as seemingly disparate as serial killers, celebrity, sport and art, and often blurred the line between fact and fiction. His approach was bold, applying a journalistic tenacity and rigor to the fictional process, and often using fictional narrative techniques in his non-fiction and reporting. His writing remains as fresh and extraordinary today as when his debut novel, the Whitbread Prize-winning Alma Cogan, was published in 1991. The body of work he has left behind includes many classics, such as Born Yesterday, The News of the Novel, which never gets old, Somebody's Husband, Somebody's Son, Happy Like Murderers, the story of Fred and Rosemary West, and Best and Edwards, a joyous celebration of football fame and oblivion. Gordon was Northeast born and his work often explored this region. It's inner psyche, it's social, political and cultural change and our role in the national political landscape. So it makes complete sense for the prize created in his honor to be rooted here. So uh, this is a book about a woman who moves from um, a state of homelessness to being an off offered an opportunity at sort of um, a corporate rehabilitation program only to then kind of slip back into um, falling through the cracks of society. And this passage in the book, she's been homeless and she's in the programme and she's heading to work for the first time and she's thinking back, it's the first time she thinks back about what happened to her before and why she feels reluctant to be going to work again. People often describe a moment in which something snapped, a singular sudden event, I wish that had been my experience, that I'd been able to reach the point I reached more efficiently. Instead, there was simply a slow fade, the gradual winding down of the mechanism that enabled me day after day to get out of bed as the sun came up, eat two pieces of toast, shower and dress, walk to the station carrying a cardboard cup of coffee that was exactly like the cardboard cups of coffee carried by all the other people walking to the station, slide unnoticed and unimportant through the stirring city and arrive at a desk with nothing to look forward to but the moment I would be able to leave that desk and retrace my steps, eat, sleep and begin again. By the end, I had fantasies of violence, of some terminal confrontational episode on my commute or in the office, but those instincts went unrealized. Instead, I simply stayed up deeper into the night, slept less, rolled into work later and later, completed an ever dwindling fraction of the tasks allotted to me until I was quietly, blessedly let go. That was the exact term my manager had used as he sat in front of me in the smallest, coldest meeting room our building contained shuffling a printed summary of my shortcomings and transgressions, you're going to be let go. I remember marvelling at the irony, the release and relief it implied. All our babble about the importance of work, and this is the euphemism we use to describe its ending. The same phrase we whisper in the ear of a dying relative, an expression best applied to the return of an animal to the wild. The horse galloping through our thoughts now is a female being, conceived, born and reared in Europe. Look, the stable is dawn dark and straw hush, and through this gloom we watch her birth, swimming hoof first from the warm ocean of her mother's body. Little footling, her hooflets are waves dashing wildly against the earth, amazed. She is of solid stock, as bright and as quick as any of her foremothers. Through each generation of her family, a human voice has echoed the same words in a series of tones. 
Good girl. Good girl. Once weaned, she is schooled in servitude. Her life's purpose, she sees, will be to bear a human weight. And she learns it quick, the ways of stirrup and bit, of rain and whip. The crisp straw of cavalry stables, the swish and clang of swords, the tang of muskets. No matter how many times Eileen Dove's poem galloped from mouth to mouth, no matter how many academic works respond to it, one detail is always missing. We never learn this horse's name. I can't bring myself to invent one. Instead, I honor her among the unnamed, a further absence among all the other female absences of this tale. I want you to know that she was a female being. I want you to know that she was a female being. I want you to know that she was. I'm just going to jump right in. This is a, I'm going to read a section from uh, an essay about Aretha Franklin's funeral. This is from the ending of an essay called On, On Going Home as Performance. It took eight full hours and a band of preachers and their many armed gospels and singers slipping out of their shoes before shaking the church walls down and old friends pacing slow through old memories and Cicely Tyson's hat casting a wide shadow over her eyes while she read a repurposed poem and showed she could still hold a room in her steady palm. Cicely, our forever godmother, who was helped off the stage by three men so a viewer might do away with the lie of her defying time. It took dancing in the aisles of a church and men hollering a friend cries a go ahead or a don't stop now when a speaker caught a good groove it took even the non-preachers becoming preachers anything spilling from the mouth in the service of a moment becoming gospel it took all of this but miss aretha franklin finally made it home on a friday evening as i watched the service live in a hotel room in atlanta other viewers spent a full work day and then some glued to their computer monitors or sneaking sips of television glances to see what might come next i fought back tears when former nba player isaiah thomas told story of stories of how Aretha helped raise him into a better man than he was. And I yawned when Clive Davis lovingly droned on about the mechanics of Aretha's singing. And I cringed during the sprawling 50 minute eulogy by Pastor Jasper Williams Jr. that spanned everything from black on black crime to the way single mothers were failing to raise their black sons spoken while Aretha Franklin, a single mother of four boys rested right before him. But when all the preaching had been preached and almost all the songs had been worn down to echoes and every memory had been rebuilt wide Wide enough for every listener to crawl into, there was Stevie Wonder, Aretha's dear old friend, singing one last tune before she was carried out of the church and on to her final resting place. And in those last swelling moments of Aretha's home going, I thought about what it is to send someone home properly. How even that, when done right, can be a performance on par with a person's living. The Portuguese soccer player Eusebio was given a towering gold casket that was then carried in circles around the Estadio de Luz in Portugal where he played for years. Michael Jackson's casket was plated with 14 karat gold and lined with velvet for a three hour ceremony that filled the Staples Center and left the crowd outside waiting. In March, 1827, tens of thousands of people marched in the streets of Vienna bearing torches in the name of Ludwig van Beethoven. And as Aretha's body and services were being prepared, John McCain's casket traversed the country he once served, having a funeral service in Arizona and then another in Washington, DC. And the joke, many black people made on the internet as Aretha's service dragged into its fifth and then sixth and then seventh hour was that we all expected this. As some tuned out and tuned back in only to see the ceremony still going on, as some scanned the pre-printed funeral agenda to see that nearly every guest speaker and performer had gone well over there a lot of time, there were some who kicked back and said, of course, of course. And I suppose we should have expected a long and drawn out affair, although deep down, I think many of us knew that this number of hours was a bit more than even our most extravagant celebrations. But at this point in my life, I have attended 
far more home goings than I ever thought I would. And so I'm no longer shocked by how time can take away and honor someone's living, how in the moment it all feels like the least one can do to honor another. But even the most seasoned of my kinfolk knew Aretha's home going was equal parts too much and somehow still not enough. Too long and too full of people with too much to say, but still it kept her with us. Some of the reverends dozed off and some of the church women's heads leaned all the way back in their pews while their mouths hung open in the eighth hour and some of the people left early and so many of my people clapped their hands together with joy and said look what we can do. Lock and Booth um, is a novel set over 100 years. The Devil's Daughter arrives in 1910 in Edinburgh. She rose there in a coffin her father the devil built for her and um, an event happens and she, she curses the building and the curse travels through the tenement and every decade for the next hundred years and we are joining Jessie McRae just as she's arrived in Edinburgh. I stop in the middle of the Tron. Behind me there is the Royal Mile, to the left is the south side and on the right North Bridge. I stand in the middle, streets crossed below me. Tenements of all heights stand as sentinels on either side. They inspect everyone who passes below. The high street is cobbled and it slopes up. There's wooden doors and small blown glass windows or fancier sash panes with wooden shutters. A motor car turns right onto Coburn Street. The spunk hawker stacks his tinder. Between the well-dressed and moneyed, there are glimpses of the hungry and hunted. A big church has a beggar sat on its steps with his ratty wee dug. A young man smiles. He wants to defile me and urge to let him right here in the street. Who can save me? My father is the devil. Our kind are not holy. I must perfectly hide the sharp tip of my horns. Wood smoke spirals out of tenement chimneys. The reek permeates everything. Pretty rooftops are tiled like dragon skin. Just as I am about to step forward, a black mass flows onto North Bridge. Along the high street, news signs declare World Missionary Conference. 1,200 men of God flock toward me. They stride in tens, twenties, hundreds. I knew God would have a message for me, but I did not know he would be so direct. Spain, 1488. I am in the Red Tower. I am searching, looking for someone. I ask, where is my boy? A voice replies, now you remember. Remember how you betrayed him, how you betrayed them all. You gave them up for gold. You watched as they bashed their heads in with rocks. Their bloody skulls caved in. They were gutted like fish, fed to gulls, thrown to smash, crash against the red rock. Red stone stained red beneath the red tower. All the boys dead. All the dead boys, now dead, red, bloody dead. The great red fortress towers tall above the cliff. A red, dead, red, the red stone. The ripped flesh drenched in sun, red with blood. Sunlight all washed red. So much red under a bloody red sky. All these young boys dead at the feet of the stone castle wall, stained with red rivers of blood, bloody, bloody blood. It rained. It poured, sea below was red. Those poor boys, all slaughtered, butchered. How brave they fought. Look in the courtyard, how the well was filled with more bloody bodies, bones and ruin. That well will never be clean again. The water always stained. The rats not ever hungry here. Crow and raven flew, all black beak crammed with red eyeball, red kidney, all the boys. See that red heart eaten by wolves. Do you remember now the wolves teeth all red with blood, the dogs, the blooded heads on spikes? Oh yes, I see it in your face. You remember it now. Um, my book is about oil rigs, um, but it's also about the search for home. 
So I'm going to read a part where I actually go home and I'm with people who feel like home to me. In conversation, my sister and I tended to refer to our mother as my mum rather than just mum, which made us sound mildly possessive and like we weren't related. I didn't fully understand her reasons for being there and I didn't much care since her presence mandated mine and made me feel less like a spinster daughter. My sister did care about my movements though. Along with the more obvious symptoms of her condition, I'd noticed an increased beadiness about her. This was probably an evolutionary explanation for this, the expectant mother's enhanced instincts, a desire to exert control around her surroundings. But in the relatively safe confines of our mother's house, it expressed itself as an extreme interest in my comings and goings. In between peering at sludge-coloured swatches and saying mouse's back and elephant's breath over and over again until the words seemed to lose all meaning, she asked questions and pulled faces at the replies. She liked to look over my shoulder at my phone and barge into the spare bedroom without knocking. If I said yes to a second glass of wine at dinner, she'd raise an eyebrow and say, getting on it, are we? Who's Caden, she said one evening. That's not a proper name. When did you get so nosy, I said, putting my phone back in my pocket. I thought pregnant women were meant to be absorbed by their condition. Thank you very much. And as you can see, it's a really varied selection of books. So how I'm going to ask you to kind of all talk about similar things and themes with them. It's going to be kind of Mission Impossible, but I thought what I'd do was go through the sort of ethos behind the Gordon Byrne Prize. And one of the things that it's about is um, books being fearless in their ambition. And all of your books are very ambitious and they all deliver. But I wanted to ask you all, what was your ambition for your book, Selena? Um, I guess I, I guess I didn't, I didn't really have any ambitions for my book. Is that a strange answer? I, I just wanted to tell the story and, and play with it and enjoy writing it, but also to be really true and as courageous as I could be with it, um, and blurring fact and fiction and dream world and, and real world, um, and, and just to be as faithful to that. That, that took a lot of courage. It was more courage, really, than ambition when I was making this, what, this book. That's really interesting, because courage actually is a theme throughout all the books. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask you, actually, Doreen, in terms of, of a ghost in the throat, like, what was your ambition with that? Was it to give voice to what felt like a ghost in your throat? I, th I think it was, Simon, yeah. I think that I just felt such a deep fidelity to Eileen Dovney Connell and I wanted to get to know her and curiously I wanted to find out whether it was possible to come to know someone who had lived and died years before I was ever born. Is that even possible? And I feel like it probably is. I, I never know. <laughs> How honest to be about this, because I know I sound quite unhinged, but I do, I do feel like the end result of that experiment was that I do think you can get come to know someone who died long before you ever lived. And um, that was fascinating to me. So in as much as, as, as that was part of what I was aiming for, if you could call that the ambition of the book, well, yeah, I did make friends with a ghost, yeah. What about you, Sam? What was the ambition for you? Um, well, I, I really, really hear what Selena is saying, the difference between um, ambition and courage. Um, I think I was keen, this is my third book, and um, I feel like my ambition is always the same now, which is to try and write myself into a, a different place and to be out of my own comfort zone, uh, you know, and to sort of push myself a little bit creatively. It was the first time I'd shifted into the first person. You know, it's, it came with its own set of challenges. Um, and I suppose there's a sense there of wanting to be outside myself, you know, not, not to write from myself and not to write as if I myself am watching someone else, but, but to write in someone else's voice. Um, and I felt like that was the most important thing to, to get right. And what about you, and if with your essays, what was kind of the ambition with such a collection? Yeah, I mean, I think that um, 
the goal with this book as it ended up, not as it began, was to, to see myself in the position of being able to evangelize and to be somewhat evangelical and to reach towards the ecstatic um, instead of the argument, right? And to, um, instead of attempting to deconstruct in the name of argument or provocation, to just kind of point at the miracle and say, can you believe the miracle? Um, you know, in some ways, I'd watched hours of Soul Train. I'd watched hours of footage of Josephine Baker. And so uh, through their living, you know, through their existences, the essays already wrote themselves. The essay had already been written. And so I, instead of trying to rewrite what has already been written, uh, I found myself in a position where I could just point at the miracle and get out of the way. Wow. Wow. And then, Tabitha, what about with you, with writing Sea State? I think my ambition with Sea State was fairly modest. Um, I just wanted to nail down a particular time, uh, which was a period in 2015 in a particular place, which was Aberdeen. Uh, I think it's almost analogous to a militarist. You know, I, I just really wanted um, to kind of get that a very small sort of space and time down on the page. That was all. Jenny, what about you with the looking booth? Um, I, I knew that I wanted to write a kind of uh, love letter to Edinburgh for a long time. Um, and then I, I wanted to capture the metamorphosis of a city over a long period of time. Um, and I was really pissed off with the uh, very public celebration of so many narcissistic, sociopathic, often men and uh, <laughs> getting nice statues and nice airplanes and all these other things. And so I was really angry about all the stories that are um, you know, hidden in the walls and interested in just how the structures we live within impact on ordinary people's lives. I think ordinary people live extraordinary lives all the time, unseen. And so those were the people I wanted to spend time with. And um, Edinburgh suffers from we, you know, we have a lot, a lot of great stuff, but a lot of the, the most interesting stories in a city like Edinburgh to me are the ones that aren't necessarily being told, so they were the ones I wanted to um, spend that time with. Well, it's my very great pleasure to announce that the winner of this year's Gordon Byrne Prize is Hanif Abdurakib. Maybe Hanif, would you like to say some words? Yeah, well, thank you. I have, you know, endless gratitude. Uh, I wish I could be there. Uh, I wish it were easier for me perhaps to get out of the States and get to spend time with you all, particularly because, uh, you know, I mentioned it before, but I, I read almost all the books by the other finalists and I, I, I so admire them and I so admire uh, everyone's writing. And, um, you know, gratitude to uh, Random House in the UK for, for doing such a wonderful job and uh, getting this books in the hands of readers over there and gratitude for the judges. And, um, you know, Gordon Byrne this morning, I, I got asked if I'd read any Gordon Byrne. I talked about the couple books of his that I'd read and about how there's a level of discomfort um, that he, uh, there's a level of discomfort in his pursuits, but he calms that discomfort by uh, such stunning writing and balance, this, this balancing act of, of terror and tenderness. And uh, I hope that I can get close to that if I, uh, if I keep trying. And one last thing I'll say is that, you know, to my peers who are here and uh, the other writers I've worked with, uh, making this book happen and bringing this book to life and the writers in my circle and the writers beyond it is, um, you know, I read, the excerpt I read was about Aretha Franklin and Aretha Franklin's homegoing. And um, something I've loved mightily is Aretha Franklin's Amazing Grace documentary. And um, there's a part in Amazing Grace on the first night where it feels like Aretha is in competition with the choir. She's like fighting against the Southern California community choir, a brilliant choir, one of the great choirs that we've had in the States. And, and they're singing, they're coming over the top of her, she's going over the top of them. It's, it's like they're colliding and, and not giving in to uh, the communal nature of what they can create as one being. 
And uh, on night two, there's this gentle giving in where Aretha realizes, at least um, through my eyes and through my ears, that uh, she is not at the head of the chorus, but is a part of the chorus. And as she is a part of the chorus, everyone witnessing what is happening in the church is a part of the chorus. And so Mick Jagger in the back clapping off beat is a part of the chorus. And the person next to Mick Jagger watching him clap off beat and correcting his clapping is a part of the chorus. <laughs> and for that, I, for that, I mean to say that um, it isn't lost on me that we all have a, a great responsibility to find our chorus and to become part of it as seamlessly as possible. And it's such an honor to be a part of the chorus of writers uh, tonight. And um, again, I wish I could be there with all of you, but I am very grateful for this, this honor. And uh, I'm glad I could beam in from my little corner of the States. Thank you. Now, I'm breaking with tradition because uh, you're supposed to do the spiel and then say the name. So I said the name because I know it's quite a painful experience to wait for the name to be said. But I'd just like to say what an amazing shortlist it was and actually a long list. And uh, I think all the writers on the panel were just awestruck by the standard and frankly a little bit intimidated. And I'd like to propose a round of applause to everybody on this shortlist because the books are amazing. <laughs>